lives in Hall County, I would put um, if you repeat after me and we will discuss the instructions. I, Andy Stewart. I, Andy Stewart. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will truly and faithfully discharge. That I will duly and faithfully discharge. All the duties. All the duties. Given to me. Given to me. Required by law. Required by law. As a member of the Gainesville City Board of Education. As a member of the Gainesville City Board of Education. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. I do further solemnly swear. I do further solemnly swear. And affirm. And affirm. That I am not the holder. And I am not the holder of any public money. Of any public money. Do this state. Do this state. Unaccounted for. Unaccounted for. And that I am not the holder. And I am. And that I am not the holder of any office of trust. Of any office of trust. Under the government of the United States. Under the government of the United States. Except postmaster. Except postmaster. Nor of either of the several states. Nor of either of the several states. Nor of any foreign states. Or of any foreign state. And that I am otherwise qualified. And that I am otherwise qualified. To hold said office. To hold said office. According to the Constitution of the United States. According to the Constitution of the United States. And laws of Georgia. And laws of Georgia. And I will support the Constitution of the United States. And that I will support the Constitution of the United States. And of this state. And of this state. So help me God. So help me God. Okay, that was a hard spot. Congratulations. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome.
by Mr. Norholz, a second by Mr. Smith. Other motions? All those in favor say aye. Mm -hmm. All right. Motion carries. Uh, no citizens comments, just confirm. Okay. Uh, Mr. Smith, you want to roll with the agenda? Uh, move to adopt the agenda with one amendment to add under Roman 12, number II, brand guidelines amendment. Brand guidelines amendment. All right, we've got a motion to adopt the agenda with a, an amendment under Roman numeral, big Roman numeral 12, little Roman numeral 7. Brand guidelines. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Smith, second by Dr. Ramsey. Any questions? All those in favor? Motion carries. All right. We need a motion to approve the minutes. Motion to approve uh, Roman approval of minutes and consent. Uh, we got a motion to approve items 9, 10. Second. Got a second by Mr. Mitchell, a motion by Mr. Smith. All those in favor? Motion carries. All right. Uh, Dr. Williams, you want to start out with the uh, governance and operations? I'm really looking forward to this evening because my name's not on the agenda a whole lot. But what I do have is what we do every January. Thank you. <laughs> uh, what we do have uh, is what we sign every year is the Code of Ethics of Board Members. You'll find those in your packet, I believe. Uh, Ms. Flores has available for you to sign. You sign those. We also submit those every year with our GSBA uh, board recognition status as well. So uh, it's a formality that we do every January uh, with the Code of Ethics and Conflict of Interest. All right. Uh, Mrs. Griffin, you want to give us an update on the Le Legacy Brick campaign? Yes, thank you. Um, we're excited to say that we have placed the first round of bricks um, alongside our existing bricks that were um, relocated in front of the new Cafeteria Media Center. So um, we sold in that initial phase from today 382 bricks. So we're really proud of that and hope that we'll continue to sell or we don't hope that we'll continue to sell. We will continue to sell bricks. Um, the deadline is still um, you know, under review, we can we can move that deadline as far as we'd like because they are great papers and can we continue to add, but most likely we'll wrap that up at the end of this school year. But I'm happy to report that we have raised $9,954.55 to contribute to the GHS alumni scholarship fund that was created by the class of 64. So to get to that odd number, there was a thousand dollar fee from the North Georgia Community Foundation as an admin for the project fee. They're the ones who host the site for credit card donations and they're also holding our funds. And so that that um, gives us that total of 9,954.55. Any questions? Mrs. Griffin, I'm embarrassed to say the campaign got away and uh, I didn't talk about even my daughter. <laughs> you still have time. Yeah, still have time. There is still time. Yeah. It does look good as you go. Uh, and, and you walk the space, uh, you will notice the new ones already laid in, as Ms. Griffin mentioned. So it's definitely, a, I think because it's now done, you're going to have more interest. So my, my question would be, <laughs> the bricks that my parents bought for me and my brother, where have they been 
relocated or are they still waiting to be placed? No, they have been placed okay. and they're they're the same area now. And so they're not uh, mixed together. They're they're actually the first section is most of the previously purchased bricks from that era. And then the new section um, is is to the right of that. And we'll have some guidance as we wrap up the project that um, list all the bricks alphabetically by the first word in the brick. And for some, the first word will be a name. For others, the first word might be go big red. And so they'll be listed by the first letter uh, in the brick alphabetically. And then we'll have a, a guide that says row one, section two, so that to help help you find your brick. And Ms. Griffin, our team did a great job of trying to ensure that anyone, uh, any, any of those bricks that were placed in front of the building before they were moved, that they're alongside the bricks they were before. So family stayed intact, relationship stayed intact. So that way you don't have to search all of it to find your bricks number one. And in, in my case, uh, my parents purchased a brick for my brother and I. Um, it's still in that, what I would call old section, but then my purchase that has me listed as Joy Brian Griffin is in the new section with my children. Um, but there is the option to put all of those in together um, if someone wants to request that. Any other questions? This is Griffin. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, next up, we got three items to be uh, presented by Mrs. Pepple. <laughs> Good afternoon. My first item is the budget timeline. Uh, we'll start off at the first of February with meetings, um, school meetings. I'll start that off with meetings with the principals on consolidated funds. We'll have budget meetings and then uh, school budget meetings with um, um, all parties involved there. And then we'll have meetings with the board and then our typical budget and members rate. Uh, meetings, and then we'll have our tentative and final adoption in May and June as typical. So that's our budget timeline for FY23 budget. We hope that based on the governor's news from last week about some of the pay increases and the promises that were made a couple of years ago, uh, that this budget uh, will see uh, some of our expenditures added back. We reduced our budget this year $2 million from the previous year. Some of that was due to our enrollment declining. Well, that enrollment came back. And so with that also requires more funds to serve our kids. So we're looking forward to seeing what the midterm adjustment looks like as well as next year's budget from the state level. And just as a reminder to my colleagues, uh, Jeremy sent out an email last, beginning of last week, I believe, uh, requesting 221 meetings. So if you have not responded, please do so. Okay, Mr. Duffel, the uh, second quarter donation report. Okay, uh, next I have the second quarter donation report. Um, any questions on this one? Uh, I do. I have one question. A few of the donations that were listed were quite sizable, mm -hmm. and of course, very much appreciated as we do appreciate a lot of them. Yes, um, do the individual schools, are they uh, tasked to thank the donor? Yes, um, they do. They send out the um, <laughs> thank you donation letters. Okay. Each school. Each school that. does. Okay. What about uh, system wide? System wide, we do. You? Yes, and Dr. Williams signs it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. And finally, uh, a report on the 2005 QCAB bond payoff. Yes, happy to report that this uh, QZAP loan has been paid in full uh, as of November of 2021. Uh, total payments over the uh, course of the bond life were $1,410,896. Can someone please enlighten like, uh, yeah. younger people uh, what that was for? So it was for Gainesville High School and Centennial, I believe, yeah. were the two projects. That it predated everybody except Willie. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so QSAP bond, um, this is now the only indebtedness we have. The Monday Mill um, bond debt uh, from SPLOS 5, which will be paid off in, at the end of this calendar year, I think is on the track for it. And then the, the indebtedness due to the high school and the middle school uh, addition. So when Kathy and I assumed these positions almost five years ago, we had five 
that we were continuing to pay on. Now, after this, we are down to two traditional bottom indebtedness payments that we have. So we're we're glad to get away from some of the nickel and diming that happened with these little amounts here and there. Uh, so it's, it's good to know that the one point four million dollars we paid off. We have been paying that, I believe, out of the general fund. Yes, we can. Uh, part, of, part of that is you look at a 15, 16 year bond, and $1.4 million is not a huge hit to the general fund. So we're glad this is coming off the books. This was an interest rate um, loan, but still, it was a, you know, something we had to budget out of the general fund. So it's nice to get that over with. All right, any other questions? All right, Ms. Pepper, we will see you later on in the meeting. Uh, next up is a, a review of our accreditation process, uh, Dr. Ruth. Good evening. Good evening. Do you all mind if I take this up? I'm battling a little laryngitis. <laughs> um, every five years, we are required to participate in an accreditation review. And this is our year, starting March 7th, um, Gainesville City Schools will participate in our accreditation review. And for those of us who've been around for a while, excuse me, we, um, you may remember the um, Southern Associations of Colleges and Schools, or SACS, that's who we initially were accredited with, and then later on, Advanced Ed. And Cognia came about by the merging of Measured Progress, which is an assessment company, um, actually out of New Hampshire and um, advanced ed. So that's how Cognia came about. So if you get correspondence talking about Cognia, that is our new advanced ed. And our process, we were fortunate that we are still being evaluated based on the um, same processes and standards that we were five years ago in 2017 by advanced ed. After this year, those standards change. So we kind of are familiar with the process and the standards. So that's to our advantage, I believe. Part of that process is that we have to have, I'm so sorry, sorry. <laughs> we have to have stakeholder um, feedback and interviews with our accreditation team. And you all are our major, one of our major stakeholders. So the team will be conducting interviews with board members and that's gonna be organized into three different sessions. So the board chair will have an interview alone and then the other board members will be grouped in pairs. So, um, and we'll give you more information about that um, as we get closer to it. And, and we also, plan to do somewhat of a dry run so that you can kind of hear the types of questions they may ask you. Um, I was fortunate to be able to um, participate on a team a couple of months ago, as well as a couple other colleagues, Dr. Sears and Dr. Roach have uh, participated. So we've heard the types of things that they're expecting from, um, or not just expecting, but questions that they're asking. And, um, and they're general, just talking about governance and policies and code of ethics. So it was interesting to hear, um, we know we do have a code of ethics, so those types of things. So just wanted to just put it out there, let you know that it's coming, and we will give you more information um, as it gets closer to that time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Dr. Rufus, how many will be on the visitation team? I think our team right now, because I don't think he's finalized it, but right now, I think there are six evaluators and there's a lead evaluator and I think he has five team members and we meet with our lead evaluator every month. And at our last meeting, he said that he's finalizing that team now. Um, so, but I can't imagine it being many more, um, usually about seven um, would be the max, but um, he has not finalized that. <clears throat> two cycles ago or 10 years ago we hosted a welcome dinner for the team uh, is that in the plans no so thank you for um bringing that up the entire review is going to be virtual for us so even the interviews will be virtual and what we will do um once 
Dr. Quintana, who is the lead evaluator, once he sends us the link, we will share with you and you just sign in on to your session for the interviews. So, so the nice part is you can see on the day, March 7th at 11, uh, if you can mark that on your calendar, be available for about an hour, yeah. a few minutes before to make sure you can get on and then also uh, for a 45 minute interview. We paired the board members based on years of experience. That's why you'll see Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Smith separate. I uh, want to have a little bit of history there. So if they start to dig into more than the last four to five years, uh, you've got that uh, perspective. Uh, also, I'll tell you under Dr. Rufus' leadership with Cognia, I'm leading the leadership capacity domain. Dr. Sears is leading the learning capacity domain. And then Ms. Collins is leading the resources uh, domain. And so we've been working solidly for about six months on making sure the evidence is being gathered, that it's presentable, not being overwhelming, but enough of a sample to really start the dialogue uh, when we get into these interviews and they get to talk to you, they get to talk to us, our leadership, our school leadership, our parents, our students, uh, and just kind of give us some feedback on where we go next. Is there any differentiation between Cognia and any other outfit that performs this service? And is, is there a reason why they're doing this? So Cognia is, is statewide. Um, it is really Southeast heavy. Uh, there are some ties to it regarding, you'll notice that in, in some school systems, when boards are not acting ethically, they'll bring in Cognia or Advanced Ed or SACS to review the board and the leadership because that is tied to hope. Uh, so if a school system is not accredited, there's some limitations possibly about the graduates receiving hope. Uh, so for us, whether it was SACS to advance ads, now Cognia, it's all the same. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So the uh, facilities would are not a part of the, um, or, or a virtual scope of the facilities? Okay, so we are being um, visited this time for as a district level. So our individual schools are not being accredited. You know, even though we gather evidence from the schools as a system, but they're looking at our system processes um, as a whole, not the individual um, schools or facilities. Okay. And for the buildings themselves, that'll come through the resources uh, that we have, the resource available to meet the needs of the kids. So between the two, I think we'll get a good, a good snapshot. Questions of Dr. Rufus? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Allen? Yeah. As Ms. Allen comes forward, uh, I want to mention that what she's going to discuss really falls in line with the decision for us as a system to go to a seven period day and just clean it up some of our policies uh, in order to make that transition. Good afternoon, board, and like Dr. Williams just mentioned, um, a team from the high school, including uh, Mr. Green, along with um, district, met with the high school just to kind of go over um, policy JBC4, which is awarding the units and transferring of credit. And this is our, <clears throat> excuse me, first reading. Um, just to note, what we wanted to do is make sure that we, re we removed and revised the language, um, particularly of the students incurring and having to pay a cost for any um, test out options. The district and the schools have been covering any of those costs um, for the students and the parents. Um, we also, um, underneath the regulations, we revised um, we revised the language and combined the three different regulations into one regulation. Um, and then also to note with the regulations, um, we already knew that the, grade, the, the grades that were earned in middle school were not included in the, um, in the HOPE ranking, but particularly for a change for our district, um, we will not be including um, local GPA for class ranking at high school. So that's um, one of the revisions that was made underneath the regulations. Um, we also, underneath the exhibit, we wanted to make sure that, again, the language involving the cost that's incurred by the student was removed um, and also included um, the registration form. We um, did some revising with that as well. Did anyone have any questions regarding JVC4 and the regulations? 
And so what you just said about how we would change how class rank was determined, could you, could you explain that again? Well, what we decided there, there had been some conversation with the high school team and then just looking at how uh, credit was awarded to students when, um, because we offer high school credit for our middle school students. And so in the past, um, say for example, if they earned a grade of a C um, in, in a high school class, say in eighth grade, then that course, the, that course would have counted toward their class ranking. And so now the language will read that it will not, they will receive the credit for the class, but they will not, it will not count toward their ranking um, in their in their prospective grades. What, what Mr. Green and his team, when they, they met with the governance council about it as well, realized was depending on which middle school you go to, if you transfer to Gainesville High School from a different middle school outside of Gainesville Middle School, it may or may not put you at an advantage or disadvantage based on how many courses you took or what you took. And so what they felt that what they wanted to recommend when we all met as a group was when you come to Gainesville High School, you're going to have the same number of opportunities to earn in the future now 28 credits versus someone else may have 31 credits, 32 credits. So then when you get the denominator involved and you're talking about class rank going out to the third or fourth decimal place, creates a lot of stress that really is determined in many ways about what you did before you got to high school. This keeps us in line with some other districts. An example would be Gwinnett. And a lot of their high school credit courses in the middle school, they'll give a P for passing. Well, it's written now that RP translates to a 70 unless you prove otherwise on the grade. So it's just trying to clean up some of that to, for our kids to have a competitive um, balance. Thank you. Do you need a motion for first read? No. Yes, sir. All right, uh, next, next one, uh, policy I. HF6. All right, and then underneath um, IHF6, which are graduation requirements, we added um, specific language to be in um, to be commensurate with the state um, statute uh, regulations that were updated in November of 2021, um, where um, we added the minimum of 70 or higher on a numerical scale. Um, just making sure that for students enrolling in the ninth grade for first time, 2008-2009 school year and subsequent years, students must successfully complete those courses um, with a minimum of 70 or higher than on a numerical scale. And then we also um, made sure that we added the college and career um, courses, which is a big piece of um, our student graduation requirement. And then on our last page, um, we wanted to update and make the language clear, so we removed learning support um, that was included in this language. So um, some of this policy had not really been revised since 2013, 2014. So there was a lot of loose language, old language, and outdated language that needed to be updated. Right, do we have any questions? Just a quick question. Um, going from four, a block schedule to seven, so for like for instance, mathematics four, where it currently is four classes of any kind and you pass, it's going to be four it, years. It, it's, it's the same. There's no difference between okay. four by four to seven. You, you have four math classes you take that are in sequential order that the state recommends in order to receive a high school diploma. So the credits that you see there, there's no change in those grades. Any other questions of Mrs. Allen? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Dr. Williams, under uh, item one of the action items, the uh, school calendar. Everybody's always looking forward to the school calendar. This is the third iteration ever since COVID hit when we had to make an adjustment. Uh, just looking at this calendar from this current year to next year, a couple of things changed. We reduced the number of open house days from three to two. One of those uh, will be working with the high school to, to set aside a separate ninth grade orientation. Some of the feedback we received from the high school and the governance council uh, was that our ninth grade students uh, need to see the building, walk the building, let's look at the schedule, let's walk those classes. Uh, at the same time, your 10th or 12th grade students already know the campus. So let's really create <coughs> something separate, uh, more specific for those night graders. Uh, you'll also see uh, a fall break day that is a day longer than what we currently have. And the way we made up for that day 
is if you look in January, like when we came back from the winter break this year, we had two work days before students came back. A lot of that was because we were a four by four schedule and you had uh, schedules that needed to get cleaned up before kids came back. Since we'll be a seven period day next year, that day was moved uh, earlier up in October. Uh, we did put in here for the middle school and high school, there's a big focus uh, at the end of each semester about midterms and final exams. Uh, one of the things that came out as a recommendation from the governance council was having basically half days, uh, dismissing at one o'clock which is just two hours early for our middle school and high school students, uh, that sometimes the productivity after they finish all of their exams uh, is not there. That gives you a day and a half roughly of inter um, interventions, remediation, credit recovery, really targeting our students. Uh, one other thing that you'll notice on here is graduation uh, is actually the Friday before we get out of school. Uh, seniors usually never report that last week of school. Uh, and also it then creates distraction for all the other students. So in this case, graduation will be on Friday, uh, May the 19th, as opposed to the 26th, which is two days after all the students have left. It'd be very hard to get everybody to, to, to come back and do it to, to that level. Uh, so the calendar has some slight adjustments, uh, but it's getting definitely back to a more traditional calendar uh, from what we've seen over the last two years, as far as a staggered start. But once again, that's been removed uh, and we know days like today, when you've got an inclement weather day, uh, we may have to adjust as the year goes on. Williams, you might have just said this, and I'm not sure if I missed it, but December 15th and 16th, where it says that's early release for 6 through 12, does that mean those will be short days, did you say? Yes, so they'll be, so our buses right now basically start a little after 2 o'clock for elementary, and then they cycle through about 3 o'clock, 3.30 for middle and high. Basically, do an early release would allow all those kids to get lunch, and then at one o'clock mm -hmm. they would be dismissed. And the elementary would still still be dismissed at the same time. Yeah. So there would be no change for elementary students. And that won't interfere with the exams. No, it will not. All the exams will be open before lunch. All right. Has this uh, calendar as it has been sent out to all the schools for commentary? It has not. So our process the last few years has been give a draft calendar. <laughs> Uh, to each of the governance councils and then let them kind of give us a recommendation to the governance councils. When they do that, uh, five of the eight schools all have the same calendar on that recommendation. So when there's very few differences between them, we just kind of make a couple of minor adjustments. Uh, we took it back to leadership both at the district office and at the school level. Uh, and so this is like 99% of what the governance councils recommended uh, to the schools. But it still goes out to the schools. Yeah. From here. Okay. I can't. You know, one, one thing we, yeah, we, we actually have an email going out this evening uh, to let everybody know at seven o'clock about the calendar. One thing that we did, if you'll notice uh, in one of our Monday messages, I think two weeks ago, we asked our employees, do they want a July or an August start? That was really determining then what this looked like. Because we did have an option where our teachers came back for a couple of days there at the end of July in order to have a couple of other days off throughout the school year, but it was two to one say, no, we want to start in August. We don't want to start in July. I can't read that and somewhere on it because they say draft. It does not. This is for the board. Okay. So the one you're sending out? Uh, the one we'd be sending out would, would be an approved calendar. Are there any other questions? Motion to approve. We've got a motion to adopt by Mr. Smith. Second. We've got a second by Dr. Randy. Any questions, comments? All those in favor? Motion carries. Mr. Owens. Good evening. Good evening. Our first request is to purchase four full four transit connect bands uh, for the use of mechanic dento, students, student clubs, um, community outreach programs, and small group activities uh, district-wide, not just high school. Uh, these bands will be purchased from Green Ford Company here in Gainesville at an amount of $32,000 each, a total of $128,000. 
uh, funding sources as the fund. So if you remember back a year ago and then a few months back, we got feedback from the community uh, as best we could on our ESSER fund and how they were used as a part of our budget submission to the state. Uh, we have requested the amount of 128000 but we only anticipated being able to purchase two vehicles at the time. Since then, uh, we have found the price to be much lower than anticipated, so we're still using the same amount. Uh, but this has been earmarked and approved at the state level to be able to, to do the um, four transit vans. And what this, so this goes back to legislation from the last legislative session where we can have uh, vans up to an eight passenger, uh, as opposed to having to take a micro bus that holds 14. So when you think about a micro bus having to go maybe to Cleveland to get McKinney Vento, which are homeless students, and bring them to school, that's not economical. We can take them in. Or if we've got three students that are participating in a state championship, we don't have to worry about a micro bus getting them there, we can use the van. So this is really going to help some of our smaller uh, services within the, within the school system. Any other questions? I know Mr. Nelson just forgot to mention that these would be added to our Elephant Express fleet. <laughs> and I then, did. And, and slipped my mind. And <laughs> be branded and signaled as such. Yes, sir. Motion to approve the addition to Elephant Express fleet. <laughs> uh, I properly noted. We've got a motion by Mr. Smith. Second. A second by Dr. Ramsey. All those in favor? Motion carries. Next one, Mr. Niles. All right, next request is to purchase uh, two Ford F-250 trucks and two trailers. Down. Again, uh, trucks will be purchased, again, green Ford, uh, amount of $98,400. Um, and they'll pull, pull trailers, uh, new trailers for a van, uh, also football, and then also football and JROTC will use use uh, some sometimes use the same trailer, whereas the van trailer will be specific for van for van. Uh, I think uh, he's planning on getting it wrapped for van and everything. Uh, so and these trailers be purchased from RPM Trailers of Brazelton an amount of twenty one thousand five hundred fifty dollars. What were the two lengths of the trailers? Yes, uh, they're uh, extended cab, uh, long bed with, of course, the tow package and everything to pull pull the trailers. What about the trailers? One was twenty eight. No, both uh, both of them now are twenty four mm -hmm. foot. Okay, twenty four. Mm -hmm. So yeah, when we went back to uh, Mr. Miller, we had thought about a twenty eight pass uh, twenty eight foot trailer for band. And he was saying that a 28 foot is just so much longer uh, that he prefers a 24 foot. So, so motion to approve. A motion by Mr. Smith. Second. Second by Mr. Gorehold. Yeah, understand? what I'd like to add is if you drive up to the bus shop area and you see the old red trailer that's the ugliest thing in any parade, <laughs> uh, every time we have a parade, I make a comment. And so now we're finally actually doing something about it. The issue is when we have our entire van at a parade, we have to carry all of our instruments for the most part. Our smaller trailer we have doesn't accommodate all those instruments. So that's why we always wind up with the ugliest trailer right before Santa. So this is going to replace that ugly old red trailer and the beat up truck that's pulling it. Correct. Um, but it also uh, will allow our ROTC program <laughs> to get their trailers out there as well. It's fairly worn. Uh, so we just thought. With the new student activity center, both band and ROTC have programs that are fantastic. We want to continue to show everybody uh, from our community that they see our ROTC program, they see our band program. Let's make everything else match it. So that's why this recommendation is coming forward. Right. Mm -hmm. Funding sources, <laughs> MO operations. Appreciate but, that, Mr. Niles. <laughs> I know right now it's difficult to buy a new car or to be able to get these. Relatively quickly. Uh, Just availability. Yeah, they told us trucks and uh, vans about a two month period we would have them. All right, we got a motion and a second. Motion by Mr. Smith, second by Mr. Norhold. All those in favor? 
Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Donalds. Uh, Mr. Pankle, you present our November and December financial statements. I'm not yet looking forward to that parade next year. <laughs> <laughs> not, uh, Memorial Day parade is going to be the first one, oh, so at least okay. that way we can showcase it sooner rather than later. <laughs> Okay, uh, the first statement is for November. Uh, we had a nice um, property tax at Warren tax receipt coming in from the city of 10 million point three nine three. That made our revenues for November 13.822. Our year to date revenues at 29.360 and that's 39.5% of our projected revenues collected. Our expenditures for November are at 6.347 million year to date at 31.748, and that's 42.5 um, expended of our projected expenditures. Our revenues over um, expenditures is 7.474 million. Our ending fund balance for November is 19.255 million. And our encumbrances is 1.732. Our ending fund balance with encumbrances is 17.522. Our this time last year we were at 41.8 percent of revenues collected, which is um, slightly higher. But we're going to make that up with our December statement. Our expenditures at 41.4 percent, which is slightly under. Um, from this year, and our ending fund balance is 18.782 last year, which were higher this year. So, and I believe, Ms. Pepper, in both of those instances at 41.8, uh, 41.4, uh, from where the budget was, uh, because we reduced two million in our expenditures this year, we also reduced our anticipated revenue for this year. So, right. we're, we're doing fairly well. Yeah, yeah, really good. Really good. And as false receipts for November is $908,072.26. So we're still in at $900,000. Mr. Chair, do you want to take these together or separate? Oh, we'll, we'll do them together. Okay. We have any questions on November? Okay. For December, we had another receipt coming in from the city of 17.388 million, which was a really good one. Uh, that made our receipts for December at 20.737 million, year to date 50.098 million. So our receipts are at 67.4 projected revenue, which is really, really good compared to this time last year. Our expenditures are 6,000,000.254 year to date, 38.024, uh, with 51% um, expended um, expenditures for this year, which is pretty much on target. Um, our revenues over expenditures for this month is uh, excellent, 14.483, but that's because of all the, all the revenue we brought in. Our ending fund balance is 33. Million seven hundred and sixteen thousand. Um, excuse me, uh, encumbrances of one point five six four, ending fund balance with encumbrances thirty two point one five one. This time last year, we had sixty three point one percent of revenue collected, and again, this month we have sixty seven point four. That's because those excellent receipts we've already uh, gotten from the city of Gainesville. Total expenditures the last year this time was 49.2 percent a little bit higher but nothing to be concerned about um december fund balance last year was 28.284 we're at 33.7 so i think we're in nice solid good shape and when you look at splash receipts in december um we had a very successful year 10.6 million dollars is definitely more than we anticipated what we actually have to look at now is when we do a splash we put a max number of splash receipts earned that either if we get to that amount or the five years ends then it's called and so we're having to monitor it over this next calendar year to see how our splash receipts are comparing to 
uh, what the voters passed about five years ago now, uh, as far as being able to, to meet that maximum threshold or not. So what would happen if we hit the, uh, it would end 2020. That was the new spots that will start in November this year. So the 2015 didn't mean, wow. That started collecting in 2017. So basically you're telling us we don't get any upside? Once so whatever we put in the referendum, let's say it's 50 million. If, whether the five years comes or the 50, millions, 50 million comes, it ends there. So the upside would just be that we paid it off earlier. No, that, that's on the revenue side. The upside is we received a lot more in our splash receipts than we anticipated. The downside is it means we then have to kind of float those funds no, for the next six months until right. the new spots gets passed. So I think we'll I think we'll be okay. Yeah, we'll be okay. Well, we'll Honestly, we'll we don't have a two hundred thousand dollar a month jump like we did over the previous year. I think we did. We got that uh, thirty six. I mean, what's the number we're trying to hit? It says life to date receipts. We'll, we'll we'll get that number. Yeah, we'll get it back. <clears throat> Any other questions? Motion to approve November and December financials. Second. Got a motion by Mr. Smith, a second by Mr. Mitchell. All those in favor? Motion carries. Uh, Mrs. Jones. Thanks, Mr. Pepper. Good afternoon. I would like to board, ask the board to approve the personnel recommendation, personnel report as submitted. Motion to approve. Got a motion by Mr. Smith, a second by Mr. Mitchell. Uh, all those in favor? Sorry, I should have shown mercy and just <laughs> called it out for you. All right. Uh, any discussion? Uh, Rand, Rand guidelines. Oh, yes, yeah. that's right. We got item number seven. Brand guidelines. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, two items to bring forward in that we did, as a board, we voted to adopt the brand guidelines that Ms. Griffin and others worked really hard to do. Two, two items I want to mention to bring to that guideline booklet. Uh, number one, she and I have researched, successfully researched, and found the component parts of the high school crest. Uh, we found the definitions of each of those symbols. It's, it's quite interesting to read. And we found it in a 1953 yearbook, uh, which listed these. So uh, my hope is that we can add the uh, a description of the crest and its component parts uh, to the guideline document. There, it's not our words, it's words we found in our research there. And uh, Ms. Griffin has the language that uh, she says can be incorporated into that. This is uh, obviously a black and white version. Is it, we is have the color version. version? Okay. Uh, the second uh, we think was just an omission on our part that did not include um, on the symbols, uh, the uh, high school symbols did not include the oval G, which has been a part of our football um, heritage since 1966. It was adopted, obviously, from uh, a an image from professional or college image, although it has its own distinctive and unique color scheme. But we did not include the oval G as an option for uh, our school's logo. And we want to add that back. So the component, <coughs> excuse me, the component parts of the high school crest and the oval G. I would like to offer as amending our brand guidelines. Mr. Smith, do we know are um, everything with the crest and the oval G consistent with the new branding guidelines? Like specifically is the color of the color version of the crest? I mean, I guess we could make some tweaks if we needed to. Just we would have to because this crest is in 
I believe it's three or four color. If I could offer a comment around the crisp, we were not able to determine a four color process, for example. We're not, we can't find a color version to know, for example, whether the crown is gold or red, for example. So what's in the brain guidelines right now is it's a red version, it's digitized and high resolution, so it can be used um, more easily. But we've kept this um, hand drawn uh, font um, for the crest, so it's very similar. We did um, omit the tongues from the beast on the side. So that uh, has been removed from the brand guidelines, um, simply because we could. Um, and we did not have reason to keep them. So I, I will, if, if you- um, They were yellow. I, okay, I, we were I, I, I was a little, I was a little afraid you were going to ask to put the tongues back. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, and so one of the reasons why we chose to omit them is because we weren't able to find reason to have them. And so, if I could just real briefly, I will share the language that Mr. Smith is referring to. So, the crown depicts queenly qualities. Gainesville is known as the Queen City of the Mountains. It means high in rank, power, and attraction. It signifies stateliness and fine caliber. The twisted rope below the crown is a symbol of the tie that binds the people of the community together. 1892 is the founding date of our school. The open book has a dual significance in that people of Gainesville are interested in greater spiritual and educational advancement. The torch is a symbol of leadership. The lion's garden, these symbols denote protection, strength, and courage. This is really, really fascinating. Uh, again, this uh, language we located was in 1953 a year which was pretty fascinating for us we don't know uh sorry that we're still searching the origin of the year this became the official press of the school we don't know that yet but we're still working i will say this this has got to be old hand. i think this predated you, me. Well, I, so, Ms. Griffin and I looked today at some of the pictures we have, and like right now, it is the red G with a white border with the black background. So, there's some variations on that, uh, but basically, it has the red, black, and black um, on the white helmet. Um, this helmet is at Texas Roadhouse, um, <laughs> <laughs> where they display old helmet, and you can tell it's old also by the face mask there. But uh, you see my point in bringing the old G. Well, I think, you know, and, I think, and, uh, there are people who think a different design would be exciting, but I think that will be the this Christmas Day strike one our time. It's exactly the exact same oval, the oval that Georgia uses, just a different color scheme. Yeah, I'm yeah. not correct. <laughs> and the yeah, I mean, I mean, Sure. And I, I think, sure, that's where the image came from. Well, what's interesting so, is if you, if you do a Google search of the history of the Georgia G and Green Bay, there's also a we found the high school up in New York. Everything was around the 60s. That decade of the 60s is when all of this G took off. This, this G first in, in that 50 years of uh, football booklet, this G appears in 1966. Okay. Yeah, I really like that G on the on the helmet. I will say the power G with the red elephant, I love too. Um, so if there's some way we can be clear that you know this is the traditional football helmet, but maybe on not replacing it, just putting it, making sure like it's an option. Yeah. Okay. That, that's a motion. Any other questions? A motion by Mr. Schmidt. Second. Got a second by Mr. Wilholz. All those in favor? Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Now, any discussion on it? I'd like to hear a motion to. Uh, Convene executive session. Uh, in about five minutes, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, let's see. So we're making no. This so a motion to motion to take the motion for exec in five minutes. Yes, second. Got a second one, Mr. Gordon. All those in favor. 